All right, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Marie Strom, and I am the VP of Global Strategy in Film Marketing here at Fabric. And I just want to say thanks again for joining us. Um, I'm going to be your host. And just some quick housekeeping items before we get started. Um, as always, um, everyone who is participating today will be on mute just so we can reduce distractions with the rest of the participants as well as the speakers. And if you have any technical difficulties or any issues getting access to this content, just chat us up and we'll be able to help you right away. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started with today's topic. And I will start with the fact that modern retail is hard. To stay competitive, retailers need to be masters of everything from product design, sourcing and buying, um, inventory management and distribution, online and offline store, storefront operations, merchandising, marketing, I can keep going on. The list goes on and on. Thankfully, advancements in e-commerce technologies such as microservices, commerce APIs, and also headless architecture have really helped to level the playing field. And it's made possible the explosive growth, flexibility, and also the customization previously only available to these billion dollar corporations. So now the question is, what's the next evolution in e-commerce? And we're about to find that out. So today we'll meet with some of Fab our Fabric team members, um, co-founder and chief strategy officer, Ryan Bartley, and VP of Marketplace Strategy and Operations, Meg Donovan. And together they're gonna discuss um, how you can grow and scale a drop shipping business with minimal risk, how marketplace transformation is transforming the future of e-commerce. And we'll also talk about what are the important considerations before getting started. Um, just quickly, the session is gonna be 30 minutes, so followed by a Q&A. And we really do appreciate everyone's participation. So please post your questions and provide your feedback in the chat and we'll make sure we get to them at the end. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, with an intro. So let me just stop sharing really quick so we can see everybody. And I thought what we can start off with is um, a quick introduction with Ryan and Meg. Um, and I'd love to hear about yourselves and your personal journey as entrepreneurs. So maybe Ryan, you can get us started. Sure, thanks Marie and welcome everybody. Uh, my name's Ryan, I'm co-founder of Fabric and Chief Strategy Officer. Uh, my career in e-commerce has been over 20 years of leading scaled e-commerce businesses, either as a product owner and technologist, or as a uh, as a general manager, leading large initiatives um, at retailers, marketplaces, omni-channel retailers, direct-to-consumer companies as well too. So I have worked and seen pretty much every use case in the industry and. Now in my current role at Fabric, I get to spend a lot of time across the industry working with our customers and our partners and our partner ecosystem to be able to uh, enable uh, folks with that scale technology that only the largest businesses in the world have the R&D uh, to do until now. So really excited to be here and thanks Marie for the, the time to talk about this very important topic. Thank you so much, Ryan. What about you, Meg? Hey, my name is Meg. Um, I'm VP of Marketplace Strategy Operations here at Fabric. I've been in the retail sector, both brick and mortar, as well as e-commerce for nearly 20 years. I've held a myriad of roles, including buying, planning, product development, sourcing, and of course, merchandising. And I've really been fortunate in those 20 years to work with some of the top names in the industry, including Saks Fifth Avenue, Bloomingdale's, Pottery Barn, Z Gallery, as well as my most recent role with Modzi, where I actually built their marketplace from the ground up. In my current role with Fabric, I'm really excited to take all of my organic knowledge and help retailers and vendors start their own marketplaces, find the right connections, find the right process of working to each other and scale their business rapidly. So whatever, what I did with Monzi and with other retailers, I'm helping you guys do at scale quickly and nimbly without actually having to hire someone internally to do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Awesome. Well, thanks for that introduction. It's great to hear about both your backgrounds and I'm sure the audience appreciates that, appreciates that as well. Um, just to set some context, but let's go ahead and get started um, with our panel questions. So Ryan, I wanted to get your thoughts on um, the current landscape of retail. <laughs> yeah, let's start off big. Uh, that's a big question. And obviously we live in very interesting times. Um, I'll start with what I'm not going to cover. Um, I'm not going to cover, you know, digital transformation, omni-channel retail, 
personalization, um, customer lifetime value, and the need to improve your brand experience. Those things, you know, are talked about on every webinar and there's pundits and analysts that, you know, have been drilling those things for ages and ages and ages. And they're extremely important. And, you know, some of the basics you must deliver uh, uh, to uh, drive not consumers, but changing from a consumer view of your company to really a community view of your company and how you think about your customers. But we'll leave that aside because I know everybody's heard about those things quite a bit as well as I have. And, you know, just a, a plug, obviously Fabric offers product capabilities and services around those. And we have a great partner ecosystem to support all of those kind of uh, basics that you must do. But what I wanted to talk about just real quickly is actually the deeper thinking about the state of retail. And if you think about what a retailer has to do or a direct-to-consumer company, or even a B2B distributor or wholesaler, each of these business models, and think about business model, is actually very risky and very hard to pull off. If you think about a retailer, um, you have to be great at a lot of different things. And Marie alluded to that, where you have to understand customer and customer sentiment. You have to be great at brand and brand marketing. You have to be great at product either building or product selection. Um, you have to be great at sourcing. You have to be great at merchandising those products. You have to be great at online uh, and digital uh, merchandising. You have to be great at retail operations. You have to be great at supply chain, logistics, fulfillment, the list goes on and on. That's not including accounting and finance and all the other things that are required to support a business. And so as I think about that business model, there's a tremendous amount of risk built into that business model because um, as we know, and as we see today, the world changes very quickly. The customer sentiment changes very quickly. Um, competitors are um, testing and learning new business models. And meanwhile, you're stuck having to be perfect at all of those different areas of your business. It's really difficult. And so that's where I think the risk of retail is really pushing companies to think about um, how do we uh, transition and transition our business model to a more lightweight and more nimble and less risky uh, 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 kind of mindset. And with that, you know, as I look out at the retail landscape, um, one of the biggest areas of opportunity of risk and reward is actually inventory. Owning, buying and procuring and sourcing and keeping your inventory in your locations and moving it around to get it closest to the customers is a huge carrying cost. And it's a long-term bet, which is really difficult to transition away from um, in a short period of time versus another area of your business. Take for digital marketing, for example. You know, it takes one phone call to turn off um, spend in digital marketing. To turn off inventory spend takes multiple quarters. You have to sell through that inventory and you have to get rid of it. And if you miss a season or if, you know, the weather bat is bad or the logistics companies that you work with um, don't perform or, you know, the myriad of things that have to do with the risk of inventory. I think that's where, you know, companies really and our partners really need to be teaching about, you need to think about um, the business model of retail and how you can start to transform that. So with the landscape of retail, just to sum that up, um, you know, ever-changing environments, ever-changing customer needs, the need is to be nimble, and now I think with technology and service providers that are out in the industry, you can start to peel away and say, where is our core differentiator, or core IP that we should focus on? What are we great at? And then what partners should we be using at the areas that are either risky and difficult or areas that you just don't have competency in? Makes sense. Thanks for that. And just as, you, as you're talking about you know, inventory, what does it mean when you say on-demand inventory? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, if you look at some of the like um, historic larger retailers in the industry, um, they are having significant issues with supply chain all the way through what is the right product styles to be selling right now in this environment. And, you know, what do I do going forward with all the uncertainty in the market? And I, I think that's always been it. It's obviously been magnified by uh, uh, COVID and by the past couple of years, but that's really the world of retail. If you've ever been a retailer, it's a battle every day 
to make sure that you're serving the right customer with the right products at the right time. And so with that, what I think is um, you have to start to drive very fast inventory turns. And the only way to do that, I, I believe at scale is by moving your model from you know, sourcing, procuring, holding, and then uh, distributing your inventory to an on-demand model where you're essentially uh, providing or putting the risk back on the suppliers and the vendors and the manufacturers of those products who you know, um, I think are better at those kind of capabilities as well too. So how do you take the customer sentiment from the market, quickly adapt to it, and be able to provide the right products and services without that carrying cost is really what we're, we're, we think of at, to be an on-demand inventory. Um, early in my career, 20 years ago, I was at Dell Computers and you know there was business models and stories written about Dell's direct model. And this is one flavor, and I think you know this is 20 years ago flavor, but it talks about the, um, the nimbleness. Dell used to have warehouse or uh, manufacturing facilities and the products, all the components of the computer were owned by the manufacturer up until it crossed a little line um, to come into the where, uh, into the manufacturing facility. So somebody owned it until Dell was, someone already bought it and they were ready to manufacture it. And I think that's the mental model that every retailer direct to consumer company needs to start thinking about and building into your business model. Otherwise you're gonna to continue to have that risk of holding inventory. Thanks for that. All right, so Meg, there's a lot of myths and misconceptions out there around drop shipping and marketplace technologies. So my question to you is, can you give us a little bit of clarity around exactly what these terms mean and address those misconceptions? Of course, yeah, it can be really confusing. Um, the terms marketplace and drop shipping are often used interchangeably, but there are some real clear differences and nuances to each of them. So a marketplace really is a site, right, that aggregates lots of brands and it connects buyers and sellers. Uh, traditionally, these brands or sellers on the marketplace are really selling directly to the end consumer, right? So they're the merchant of record. They set the price and they run any promotions on that product. They really own that product in many aspects. And then the end consumer, when they're buying on a marketplace, understand that they're buying directly from that brand, right? So they're expecting the packaging, all of the look to be that brand, that branded packaging, um, even if they're purchasing it from a site that isn't that brand site. A really great example of this, obviously, is Amazon, right? So if you buy a large scale item, let's say a baby stroller, one of my more recent purchases, um, and you buy that on Amazon, you're going to get a branded box from the brand that you are purchasing, although I purchased it on Amazon. Um, so that is really different than drop shipping, okay? So drop shipping is really best defined as a retail fulfillment method. Okay, a retailer is selling products to their consumers and their, their customers, really, the same way they would in any other product they own. However, they're not actually holding the inventory for that product. So instead, when the order is placed on their, on their site, they'll transmit the order to the vendor. The vendor then fulfills that order from their warehouse and ships it directly to the consumer. Um, so the key difference in this process is for, you know, versus a marketplace is that the retailer controls that selling price and any promotions associated with that, right? So not the brand, but the retailer itself. Um, some of the, mis the biggest misconceptions around drop shipping really, um, there are a myriad, but I'll address some of the key ones, which is really like low quality, that the products are low quality. Um, it's slow to ship, the process is really difficult. And then like this whole concept that I heard recently, which is like, it's a fad. Oh, it's new, it's a fad, it's going away, don't, don't worry about it. Okay, first of all, th those are all false, <laughs> They're not true whatsoever. <laughs> you know, drop shipping has been around for years and it's not going anywhere, right? It, if anything, it's growing, it's a bigger part of people's strategies and it's a, and a strategic part of being able to scale and grow very quickly. Um, and then the other thing is about quality, right? So a lot of people feel like a drop shipped product must be poor quality. So yes, opening price point product can be drop shipped, but so can a $3,000 marble console table, right? So the process of drop ship doesn't actually indicate quality of the product being drop shipped. It can be anything and that's kind of exciting, right? 
Um, and with the right partner, both from like a vendor side and a drop shipping enabling platform, you can really drop ship anything and easily manage the process from earrings to large scale pieces of furniture to custom products, like anything with all the right partners can be done easily. Um, from a shipping standpoint, you know, that whole concept of, oh, it's much slower, you can't control it, you know, you're getting yourself into a big headache, that's definitely not true either. So really, if you think about your business, and depending on how many people you have in your logistics network, or the locations of your warehouse, or even if you have a warehouse, often drop shipping will be faster in fulfillment to your customer than if you held it yourself. Let's say you're based on the East Coast, your consumer's based on the West Coast, your you know, your vendor that you're purchasing through is on the West Coast, they're going to get that days, if not weeks, sooner from your vendor than they would from you. So it's really important to understand that, like, you can really offer your customer a high quality product quickly, easily, and without inventory investment by drop shipping it. Got it. Interesting points there. It's interesting that also the fact that people think that drop shipping is a fad. I'd love to pick your brain more on that. Um, more on just the industry. So can you tell me a little bit about the current marketplace industry and where it's going? Yeah. Um, so the interesting thing about the industry, and I think that's also why people get confused about the two terms, is that there really is this trend almost or thought of blending a true marketplace concept and a drop shipping powered marketplace, right? So many e-commerce platforms are presenting brands on their sites where they control the price but are not holding the inventory. So they're truly doing it through drop ship, um, but they're showing tons and tons of brands. So it could look like a more pure marketplace. Um, they may sell most of their products through drop ship, which I mean, a good example of this is actually Wayfair, right? So Wayfair started as a marketplace for home goods in what it is now, which is hundreds and hundreds of brands and thousands and thousands of products without holding inventory for any of them. You know, now they've kind of evolved and maybe five to 10% of like their good products will be stocked by them, but that still leaves anywhere from 95 to 90% of the products are being fulfilled and sent to customers through dropship, right? Um, additionally, sort of more traditional um, retailers or those who are opening up their presence in um, online environments are really creating what I like to call like a white labeled marketplace where they may be extending their core offering through dropship products. So to a consumer, it looks like it's that brand's product. Um, but in reality, it's actually a brand they're working with, a vendor they're working with, and they've white labeled it in their experience. Um, and this could really be addressed through expanding your core offering in size or color extensions of stock merchandise, um, or even whole new categories of business being offered. Um, one of my favorite examples of this actually is Pier One. So when Pier One had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stores, they offered drapery panels stocked in the core sizes in their, in their stores. And they started seeing they had an opportunity to expand to drapery hardware. Like you have the drapes, you have to get them on, on the wall. You have to get them over the, <laughs> over the windows, right? Um, but if you think of all the components in drapery hardware and like window lengths, the holdbacks, the finial ties, like that's thousands and hundreds of SKUs and actually really rolled up to, if stopped, millions of dollars in investment. They were easily actually able to service this customer by offering this new category and service category of their you know, best-selling product online and then fulfilling it through dropship. And virtually overnight, they were able to really double that business. They met their customers' needs. They were able to keep the customer in-house and they weren't having to really invest those million dollars in the investment of uh, stocking it. Another way retailers are kind of using dropship is um, literally capturing more of a customer's like spin through the lifestyle, right? Or extensions of affinity category. So an example would be say a children's clothing line. Um, they focused exclusively on clothing, you know, tops, onesies, you know, littles like that. And they wanna capture more of the entire environment or eco life cycle of that customer. So they start adding brands that they trust in strollers, toys, decor, things that like while a customer is shopping for clothing and like, oh, actually, you know, I really do love that little like Wally cow. Let's like add that to my basket. Well, the customer, it doesn't know that they're not buying it or maybe sometimes they do, but they don't care. It is with both the aesthetic, it's the quality they believe in and, they're, and, the, and the retailer is able to service that customer through dropshipping it. 
Thanks for sharing that. Can you talk, I, I think you already alluded to some of this in, in these examples, but are there any other like or latest trends that we're seeing today in marketplaces and drop shipping that, that you know, um, are interesting? Yeah, I actually, um, so I'm actually really excited about this in drop shipping. Um, so what I'm loving to see is that retailers and merchants are really expanding their minds about dropship and the product they can offer on dropship, right? So gone are the days when it was all about the littles, like a t-shirt, uh, earrings, like small things that were very like small packaged, uh, FedExable, UPS, easy, cheap things to, to ship, right? And they're really saying, it doesn't have to fit into these constraints. I can offer unusual, unique items. I can I can take chances. So things that are being looked at and, and being offered through Dropship now with really cool retailers are, you know, limited edition art, customizable furniture and lighting, um, even made to order production is getting to customers through Dropship. So the concept of the endless aisle is allowing retailers to take chances and the customers are really benefiting. So that is a trend I love to see grow because it really means you're able to like think, you know, the sky is the limit on what you can do in offering your customers uniqueness. And Meg, I love that. I think like, you know, there's a, a, what I would say a new era of uh, merchandising. <laughs> and, you know, uh, the merchant um, really understanding the customer and the customer sentiment and where that brand can play and the adjacencies to the brand, I think are really exciting. So as you mentioned, um, you know, it's just it expands kind of your um, opportunity to test and learn without, you know, taking those huge investments of, you know, quarters or years worth of inventory um, that may drag you down if you make a bad bet as a, as a merchant. <laughs> This gives you a, a, a more lightweight, I'd say, way to 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 test and learn. Oh, completely. Yeah, I, I think every I merchant's had that time where they've been like, oh, I bet on the wrong thing there. <laughs> 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 That's great. Ryan, where where do you see marketplace technology a few years for your, a few years from now, given like the current state of e-commerce in general? Yeah, well, I, I think this is a beautiful time to really start to adopt marketplace technology. Five years ago, it was hard. Um, it was a, you know, a IT project that took multiple teams to come together to integrate with, you know, these third party platforms. However, with the rise of APIs and modular architecture, um, it's real simple. Uh, most of our customers at Fabric who uh, leverage our marketplace product actually launch in weeks. Um, and so it becomes pretty simple. Uh, to you know, kind of add that on to wherever you may be within your digital journey. If you have a modern platform, great. If you have, you know, a, a set of legacy systems, that's fine as well too. Um, I think it's now much much simpler with the technology that exists today, which is great. Mm -hmm. However, and I, you know, I think in the future, um, what you'll see is a, a couple of areas of opportunity really being driven into the technology. The first is really around intelligence, right? Taking the signals from the customer and the demands. You know, one thing we like to talk about is you should actually not look at what customers are purchasing to think about your inventory or your product decisions, but really what are the customers looking for? So what are they searching for? What are the glance views that um, customers are, you know, asking for? As um, Meg mentioned, you know, or if I'm buying drapes, if I'm searching for the hardware around drapes, that's a perfect opportunity. So mining that data at scale, I think is um, where the software will go to really be more intelligent, to give the merchants more mm -hmm. insight than you know, what they can glean from just talking with customers and you know, going to uh, kind of the street and understanding the customer sentiment. Um, the other area that I think you'll see is just a deeper kind of level of integration in the workflows that happen across the industry, right? my trading relationships with those vendors, um, how am I monitoring and measuring that they're supporting my customer in the right way? Um, you know, today we have really strong kind of service level reports and ability to manage that. However, you know, the, again, the shipping and logistics networks in the world are complex and need um, changes. And so what you'll see is a lot more adaptability built into the software um, and a lot more intelligence built into the software, but Again, today, I think we're in kind of this sweet spot now where you can adopt the technology really easy 
And again, what it does for the merchants is it allows them to be creative without you know the kind of weight on their shoulders of worrying about, um, did I miss that one this time? Because that could be a multi-million dollar decision if you have to own the inventory. Thanks for that. So Meg, you were the head of drop shipping at Modsie, your previous company. Can you share a bit about that experience and what you learned? Sure, yeah. Um, I actually um, was at Monzi almost uh, started five years ago, around the time that Ryan's talking about it being difficult to mm -hmm. implement and scale a business. Um, so when I joined Monzi, I created merchandising for them um, as their first merchant, their first uh, sort of vision in terms of merchandising, product assortment, all of that. And I built their direct vendor marketplace from the ground up. Um, and building a business from scratch, it's super exciting, right? It's rewarding, it's exciting, but it is, it's work, right? It's, it's good work, but it can be challenging, especially when you're trying to own all of these different things. Um, I was really fortunate that I had been in the industry for many years and I'd been, I'd scaled many different categories through a traditional buying and stocking method. So, for me, the hows in building a business, like choosing the right assortment, pricing, category focus, and like where to source product was second nature. I didn't have to learn that on the job, luckily. Um, but doing all of this from a pure drop shipping standpoint was completely new, right? So I learned a ton about shipping, packaging, logistics, the importance of top-notch product data and imagery, you know? And I was actually really surprised at how many amazing vendors I had worked with throughout my career and through the years multi-million dollar stock programs, I was amazed that they actually offered Dropship as an arm in their business, that that was an opportunity to continue growing and working with them. And I really learned that through Dropshipping, I was rapidly able to scale a business from zero to $30 million in under four years, right? So not stocking one piece of the inventory that we sold. You know, and this was really accomplished with like lower startup costs, lower storage and logistics costs, a broader product offering um, than I would have been able to offer traditionally. And honestly, the biggest thing was flexibility, right? So Ryan alluded to as well as like, I was able to be nimble and react quickly to my customer's needs because I wasn't stocking it. I could take those chances. I could say like, let's do a test, let's do a read and then like really believe in it, either market behind it or whatever you want to do. And just to reiterate, I love Motsi's model. I mean, Motsi, at the core kind of um, view of what Motsi does is it connects you directly with a um, team of uh, folks who can help you design spaces and visualize those spaces. And then it connects you again through Dropship to all of the product selection that you may need. And so for me as a consumer, I actually, you know, I'm a customer of Motsi because um, we're updating my living room right now. And, you know, how do you kind of tie together a full package? Well, I'm not going to go out and spend, you know, tens of thousands of dollars on an interior designer, but I can be connected um, with the specialty and the expertise and visualize that and have optionality in it. So the, the kind of customer value is tremendous in that place. And I think the only way you can scale that um, as a, you know, a, a growing startup is, um, by having an asset light model. So I think dropship makes perfect sense for, you know, Modsy's kind of core IP, which is really in that design area of focus. Yeah, talk about an elevated experience too, right? Um, for you, Meg, what are some of the things to keep in mind for the folks on, on this webinar um, when they're starting a new dropshipping business or for anybody? Yeah. Well, so... Really, before starting a the business, you really want to think about like operational requirements. Um, and the good news is that there aren't many, right? So the most important thing is to really find the right partner from a platform and technology standpoint. And that will do a lot of the heavy lifting for you, right? So you can focus on other things, right? So from ingestion and management of product data and imagery, mapping, inventory syncing, taxonomy, you know, organ organized and rapid transmission of orders, fulfillment management, all of those things. If you find the right partner and the solution, then you can really like make sure that both you and your vendors are able to like easily use that solution and corporate, incorporate it into your like current backend or your current process. That's the key to success in it, right? So that you can really focus on what's important. Um, not that that isn't important, but you cannot be a master of all. <laughs> you can't, right? So finding the right partner really allows you to 
refocus your efforts and your time and your limited people resources and time resources on some of the other stuff that grows your business, like fun stuff, product, business growth, strategies, uh, you know, partnerships, things that can really let you excel and not get bogged down in some of the, the nitty gritty. Thank you. And then Ryan, same question. Um, what advice do you have for companies who are looking to start with marketplaces, with marketplace or dropship? Yeah, I would, I would just reiterate that, you know, you should find a partner who can really take care of um, the technical bits and making sure that, you know, it covers off all of your use cases and covers off all the key integrations and orchestration that's required um, to make sure you have a common visibility across all your products. You may be a retailer who does stock your kind of short tail or, or you know, your core product selection and you want to expand a new product selection um, with Dropship. And, but, you know, at the end of the day, you need a holistic view of your entire business. And so it has to flow through all of your kind of systems and platform. And there's playbooks and partners um, that can easily implement that um, quickly. So you can get back to business, as Meg said, you know, growing the business and thinking about merchandising, as opposed to um, considering, you know, like, how do I rationalize my reporting? <laughs> uh, there's partners out there to do that and know how to do that quickly as well too. So I would say um, largely, you know, uh, think it and define that change to your business model. I think every retailer, every direct consumer company will quickly bring this up as a priority if you draw, you know, a quick ROI on top of um, how do we scale the business without the cost of inventory. It's always, you know, one of the kind of things that rise to the top of the list of um, adding additional value to the company very quickly um, without a lot of risk. And so I would say do that, you know, start with the planning and build the business model, um, you know, get the buy-in from the teams that you need to, and then quickly move to execution of it. Got it. Meg, any parting thoughts on like, you know, what's the best way for a business to get started? Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, I, I think we've, we've said it multiple times, finding the right partner, right? Yeah. So like starting a dropship business is just like starting any business, except that, you know, you want to set your strategy. You want to make sure you have a purpose. You want to know where your white space is. You want to know what you need to, you know, offer your customer, what has worked for them and you in the past and what you're looking forward to in the future, where you can own an aspect of the market or even you know, build a market, right? Like build a space that hadn't been there. You know, I think that's where you should focus the majority of your energy and then find the right partner to do the rest. And then what I like to do when I think about how you think about that, it's like, I like to do this. Think of it, this is like, I had unlimited funds. I can dream up the business I want to give to my customer because money is no, like, it's is not a hurdle, right? I have unlimited funds. I have the biggest open to buy I've ever seen in my life, so to speak. And so I can then paint the picture of what I want to offer um, and then find the right vendors, the right product, find the right partner from a technological standpoint and implementation standpoint to make that a reality. Because really the dropship business model is akin to an endless checkbook. Great, thank you. And then any last remarks from either of you? Before we move to Q and A, okay. Yeah, let's move in. Awesome. Well, great. We've got some good questions that came in. Thanks everybody for participating. Um, Meg, I think this one's going to be for you. This first one is, and I think we've actually covered a lot of this. So, bear with me here. Is there a model or solution for collaboration between suppliers, fulfillment centers, and retailers that could be similar to, but a more customized evolving of drop shipping? Yeah. Um, so, you know, drop shipping, as I mentioned, is a fulfillment model, right? So when you're looking about all of those people that you mentioned, you're thinking about different aspects of partnership within your business, right? You've got your 3PL that might be your fulfillment center. You've got your vendors um, that you're working with that are providing the product. Um, it's all about making sure that you have a core epicenter that talks to each one of those partners quickly and accurately through data and through connection. Um, and that's that's really the ecosystem of being able to create a dropship model that is multi-tiered in the approach. Got it. And then how to scale merchandise business, how to scale a merchandise business on demand for schools and colleges? 
This is an interesting one. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so when I think about that, I think my um, merchandising for schools and colleges is a lot about branded merchandise, right? And I think when people think about branded merchandise, they immediately think, I need to find someone who's going to make this for me and I need to stock it. Um, mm -hmm. There are lots and lots of partners out there that will make branded merchandise for you and drop ship for you. So um, a really good exa example is like actually Vulcan. They do a lot of like snow, uh, snow ski focused accessories, and they have a huge selection of uh, snow goggles, really gorgeous, amazing very, very cool snow goggles. And 90% of those branded snow goggles on Volcom are actually drop ship. So they have a partner that makes them, make sure that they're branded, they're exactly on par, they're exactly the aesthetic, it's at the price point, the quality that Volcom wants, and it's drop ship. So I think that's really where um, schools can, and schools and universities can find right partners to make that happen. And then they don't have to do the investment. Because I know that it's a lot, it's a lot of skews when you're especially working at branded product. Yeah. Yeah, and I would just um, I would add to that, you know, like by adding um, a marketplace or a dropship platform, you get access and visibility to vendors you may not even have heard of before, um, and I, I think that can actually fundamentally change your business. You know, as you kind of explore those adjacencies or those main categories, and you get to identify new vendors to work with. I think that's an exciting thing as a merchant as well, too. Thanks for that, guys. Other question is, and I think you also alluded to this already, Megan, but um, drop shipping has been around for quite some time. What's new, fast or easier integration? This yeah. is actually for both of you. Yeah. Ryan, do you want to go first? I'm, I'm happy to, to punt it as well. Sure. So uh, yes, it has been around and there's core basics. A product is a product, inventory is inventory, you know, a price is a price and um, all the kind of basics are have been around and I don't think will change right the product is product. <laughs> yeah. what I think is interesting is uh, again the on the technology side I'll cover that is um, it's much more simple and seamless to to integrate with you know your current state of platform um, to get up and running quickly again you know in the past I think the technologies in the space have been really difficult so now you have a, a much more lightweight um, approach to get up and running and get started so you don't have to you know take those long business case cycles and long implementation cycles that um, you've had to weigh that risk in the past so I think that's probably the newest and most exciting thing is like it's available and feasible to do this mm -hmm. quickly yeah. I, I'd add to the sheer amount of data on product like build mm -hmm quality information that is that's become much more of a focus today in drop shipping as it's emerged into bigger more complex even more expensive uh, categories of product that having more information about the details and like the fit the build the quality is super important and that's something that was not um, as much of a focus in the early iterations of dropship as it is now yeah. Yeah, and I'll add on to that uh, as well. You know, we see customers adopting uh, Fabric Marketplace, and when they're looking at the data that's coming in from these new vendors for these new categories, they actually find that the data quality and expansiveness of the data actually outweighs their current catalog. <laughs> and um, in many cases, they'll go back and really rethink how are we collecting holistically the right data across, you know, our products that we own and we have inventory on and the products that we're expanding into through our dropship program. And at the end of the day, you know, you're serving your customer with the right kind of information they need to make that purchase decision. And then your downstream kind of folks who have to manage all of that as well too. And so um, I, I agree with Meg, I think getting that uh, information and that quality of data and attributes um, spot on can lead to many upstream improvements from SEO to, you know, um, just customer understanding of your product selection as well, too. And then as they get into your experience, then, you know, if you're providing better information um, uh, to make a purchase, then you'll see conversion go up uh, pretty quickly as, as well, too. So can't stress enough, you know, image quality, data attributes, mm -hmm. and understanding that data has really been a, a, a positive kind of um, addition from adding on a marketplace or dropship platform. Great. Um, I think we've got time for two more questions. Again, thanks audience for your participation here. This is great. Um, 
This might be for both of you. Um, does Fabric Solutions support on-demand inventory? And is there support for drop shipping through Fabric Platform? Uh, yes and yes. <laughs> And then this is uh, this is actually specifically for you, Meg. Um, if you're a small company, say a fitness studio, just starting to sell small items like bar socks, t-shirts, yoga mats, et cetera, what's the best and easiest way to start selling retail products to our online clients? You mentioned marketplace like Amazon to sell on and drop shipping. Out of the two, what do you recommend and how do we get started? Okay, so... I will say that I recommend drop shipping. Um, there's a myriad of reasons why. Um, I love Amazon. I'm a huge, I probably spent a good amount of my salary on Amazon. However, <laughs> if you were starting off as a small seller, you will get lost. You will get lost in the shuffle. There was a lot of product. Um, I think even as a, as a purchaser of product on Amazon, you can find sometimes it's very hard to find what you want, right? So if you are trying to sell directly to your consumer, um, you want to make sure that you can also control your voice. You can have the, you can make sure that you're clear on what you're offering. You're able to really highlight the quality of the product. Like a lot of the things that Ryan were just mentioning about and like bringing out the right data, making sure that that is really um, front and center so you can increase conversion. So drop shipping, so supporting a small shop with on with on your your website presence is probably critical to growing rapidly and then that way you can actually really control the entire life cycle of your customer within your experience so that would be my recommendation and if you need help just ping us at fabric and we're happy to help you um, look through that journey and what are the right partners and the right steps to make that happen awesome and congratulations starting new business is exciting <laughs> Well, great. Well, as I think that's all the questions again. Thanks. Thanks everyone for participating. As Ryan and Megan um, have discussed, being a master across all the functions in a modern retail stack is very difficult and it's sometimes seems impossible. But today we learned how marketplace technologies such as Fabric Marketplace can enable virtual inventory and are the key to unlocking new sources of revenue without any risk or significant investments. Um, if you have any questions or would like to learn more about how to, you can leverage any of our fabric um, uh, tools and modular e-commerce, um, please don't hesitate to visit us at our website. Uh, give us a shout. Um, you can schedule a demo with us as well. Thanks all for your time and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.